Hello, I'm Francesco Lecce Chong, music director of the Eugene Symphony, and I'm coming to you from the Jordan Schnitzer Museum of Art here in this beautiful gallery, their new installation, Metamorphosis, visualizing the music of Paul Hindemith. This is so exciting for me to be here in person and see what really has already been a year-long project to think about the music of Hindemith and how that could be represented visually, especially this work, uh, Metamorphosis on Themes of Weber. So uh, this, this project obviously has been delayed a little bit and, and that's what's really special to be able to come here and, and talk a little bit about the art that is here, what these four incredible organ artists have put together. And then of course, we're looking forward to being able to gather once again in concert halls so we can celebrate how this art can be combined with this amazing music. So Paul Hindemith uh, wrote this work in 1943. It's really a staple of the repertoire when it comes to musicians and pieces that we have to study when we're first learning about how music is constructed because that's really what this work is. Uh, Hindemith takes the themes of Karl Maria von Weber who was a uh, famous opera composer in the 1800s. Weber was so great at kind of spinning out melodies and themes, but didn't necessarily always do that much with them. And especially in these four pieces, there were, there were just piano pieces, very simple piano pieces. But Hindemith digs into them and basically wants to show how a theme can change over time with sometimes just very little alterations, but over time, a piece or a theme can become something very, very different than how it started. So it's different than uh, perhaps what many people are familiar with in music, which is theme and variations. Um, this idea of metamorphosis is much more complex. And what I've often thought about over the years was how to explain this to listeners. Because you know we as musicians will break this piece down measure by measure to study what Hindemith has done with the original themes. But ultimately, this piece goes by very fast. Each movement is maybe only four to six minutes long. And so it kind of, it's wonderful, enjoyable music, but I don't think everyone can really appreciate the construction of, of the piece. And so my thought process behind this is what if we could work with some artists and not just have them be inspired by the music, but actually help them graphically represent what is happening in real time in the music. And that's what we're looking forward to doing eventually is, is coming together in the concert hall and being able to show our audience in real time, visually, what is happening with the music that they are listening to. Okay, so let's take a, a walk over to this first movement of the Hindemith with the artist Andy Myers uh, in this incredible, just massive piece, which I think fits really well with the, with the music. I mean, this, the piece opens up so strong, so bold, and it kind of hits you fast and wild. Um, in the structure of this first movement, we basically have four themes. They're, they're quite fast, they come right at you, four different ideas. Then there's uh, a bit of a lyrical contrasting section, and then those four themes come back and they hit you again, except this time what Hindemith does is he's playing with the length of those themes. So he starts truncating them or extending them or doing little things that almost imperceptibly change, but it feels different. And so what we'll be working uh, with Andy on is, is he has this just incredible piece here, and there's so much we can do with it. And we're actually gonna work a little bit with some animation. So not only will you get to see this piece in all its glory on like a big screen over the orchestra, but we're gonna be able to zoom in at key moments and be able to show this work um, in kind of different sections to go with the four sections of the piece. And ultimately when we return to those four themes that I was talking about, we'll be able to show something that's similar, but also a little bit different. And ultimately, just like a great piece of music, it's really just one cohesive piece of art. Well, let's go ahead and move on to the second movement of the Hindemith, uh, represented with the artist Anna Fiddler. Uh, this is a great, amazing collection of three pieces that she put together for this second movement. Now, this, the second movement of the Hindemith is by far the most famous. It's incredibly intricate. It's, it's kind of the, the poster child for these four movements. Uh, it's definitely the one where Hindemith went kind of the most crazy as far as seeing how far he could take this idea of metamorphosis. And so we're going to have a very intricate way of showing um, these three pieces. 
but it's, it's wonderful that they're, they're very abstract. There's a lot of patterns. There's, um, there's a lot of kind of just angular and a lot uh, angular movement and a lot of energy in these pieces that represents so well um, this second movement. A lot like the first movement, things are coming kind of real, really fast at you, uh, but there's actually pretty much only one theme and it just slowly continues to change over time. Uh, and, and it's just, it, that's what we kind of want to show in these three pieces is, you know, first it's just repeated over and over this theme. And, and then what started off as a fun little light flute melody will eventually become a full on like jazz brass band. And then it, you know, then there's like a timpani solo, like this crazy drum solo in the middle of it. Um, and then it kind of comes back and turns into this really repetitive, crazy chorus of all the instruments joining in with this theme. It, it basically takes on so many different characters in a very short space of time. So there are basically three, almost three metamorphosis uh, ideas that this the one theme goes through in this piece, and that's why we have these three different pieces. Uh, Anna has done something really amazing with these pieces where she has created pieces of, of basically white paper that can cover every single element uh, in, in this work. And so you can start off with this piece looking completely white, and then very slowly we can pick off white these white pieces and begin to see these patterns emerge. And it's a little bit uh, like what's happening in the music. And that's what we're gonna play with in real time. When you watch these pieces being presented while the orchestra is performing, you'll see these pieces appear and contract and things appear and then disappear. Um, basically, again, kind of using a sort of animation effect with these white pieces that will be covering up different elements uh, in these works. So very excited to see how these pieces turn out with the music. And I think the energy they bring, that angular movement, it just goes so well with this music. So we're now here at the third movement with the artist Mika Aono. And this, she has created several amazing pieces to go with this third movement. In many ways, I, I love that it, in the fact that musically perhaps the third movement is the simplest of the four movements, but I think uh, with the art that Mika has created, she's actually added a lot to this music and brought out a lot of the intricacies where I think otherwise the listener Honestly, after the second movement and the, the kaleidoscopic amount of sounds that are hitting you in the second movement, it's easy for the audience to think, oh, we're just gonna like take a break, get a breather in the third movement, and they miss out on some of the detail. And I think with the art that Mika has created, it's gonna bring us right into this, the world of this third movement, and people are really gonna have a heightened sense of what's happening in the music. And we can get that just from looking at these first two pieces here. There's a very simple and, and beautiful theme that opens up this movement. And there's a, there, there are still a lot of layers underneath the melody. And so Mika plays with that, uh, with what she's done here with these um, basically prints uh, using uh, wood. And, and so we have these, these layers here so that you'll get a sense of the different textures of the music. Now this first theme and the way it's openly stated, at the very end of the piece, it will come back once again. And when it does, there's these little flute embellishments on top of it. All of this, these, these little fluttery notes begin to kind of come in and out of the music. And so still sticking with the idea of kind of the, the woodblock print, if you will, uh, Mika's actually used um, basically like, like bark beetles and, and the patterns that they make uh, in wood and then using that to create these prints. And uh, I'm sure I'm not explaining it as well as she can, but it, it is amazing that basically using the same technique and the same structure as what we were looking at when we first heard the theme, when the theme comes back with all these embellishments on it, how perfect that she uses in some ways the same technique. And then look what we have suddenly is all of these intricate lines. Um, and again, creating their own sense of texture, um, but in many ways, you know, suddenly being something very different. And I think that's really at the heart of what Hindemith was trying to accomplish in this music. If we take a look uh, over at some of the other things she did, there's obviously more than just one theme in this second, uh, in this third movement. So what we also have uh, in, in, to contrast with a rather more simple and, and delicate theme is a second theme in the center of this third movement that is big swaths of color, big lyrical string sounds. 
And, and for that, it's, it's quite remarkable, I think, what, what Mika put together. I was completely fooled at first, thinking that she'd found some kind of large brush or something to create the, these, um, th this feeling of movement in this work. These are also prints, which is, to me, it's truly astounding how carefully she uh, you know, would carve the woods so that it gave the appearance of being like a large brush that had just gone right over the paper. And so I love the, the fact that it was you know, perhaps created very statically, and yet you have this movement um, throughout the piece. And I, I think it really captures this sec center section of the uh, third movement. And then what's really great is, you know, what was wonderful in talking to the artists was discussing the, the things that I hear in the music and the really detailed structure, stuff that I would normally not bother anyone with. Um, and, and so in this third movement, there's like basically a 15 second, what I call bridge in, in the middle of this piece where it's music that doesn't appear anywhere else in it, but it kind of gets us from point A to point B. And I remember telling Mika, like, don't worry about it. Like, if, if there's, you don't have to do anything for this section. I just want you to know that there's these 15 seconds that are just kind of this bridge. Uh, but she actually came back and felt really inspired by that bridge. And so th these incredible pieces uh, that she created for us, I think, are going to actually make this bridge stand out in the music. And again, something that you know normally wouldn't really matter to an audience that they're hearing new material suddenly in the middle of this piece. I think now we're all going to realize we're hearing something different because the art is going to change even briefly um, it will heighten the effect of new music as well So here we are at the fourth movement with the artist Julia Oldham. She does a lot of you know, video art and animation, and we really worked together on creating kind of basically three different videos that would represent three elements in this final movement. Uh, we have you know, two themes, and then we have this fanfare, this big brash fanfare that interrupts. It comes at the beginning and it interrupts um, throughout this, this final movement. Now this last movement is a march, and it has a lot of just constant forward uh, momentum. And I think this is captured really beautifully in the three pieces that Julia put together. And we talked a little bit, one of the fun things talking with her was how to have the animation depict what was happening, happening musically on a really detailed level. And so for instance, the first theme of this march features falling figures. So the notes are always falling downwards. And so the animation at the same time will take us through this landscape, but will always be moving downwards through this landscape. Whereas for the second theme, which is a much more upbeat uh, idea where the notes are always going upwards, um, we're taken through this kind of cityscape and we're taken through it with the camera always kind of going up on, in the animation. So we always feel like we're lifting ourselves up. And then this fanfare will basically be uh, represented by this kind of primordial ooze, or almost like if you're down in the sewer system, for instance. Uh, each time the fanfare comes back, we're going to be kind of going back to this ooze that is growing and growing, and each time until finally at the very end, of course, it, it fills up the, the screen. I think it's really interesting what, what Julia did in, in taking this um, kind of ecological look. Uh, uh, you know, obviously, uh, so much of her artwork is inspired by this idea, but I think it fits really well with this piece in many ways because there is an inevitable feel to this music, the way it just marches forward. Um, and I, I think, you know, thinking about kind of human interactions with our environment um, and trying to bring awareness to that, which is what she's trying to do in her artwork. I think she's also captured an essence of this piece, which is um, this relentless forward momentum. And I think in, in many ways, this final movement is going to leave us with uh, a few questions. And I think that's actually kind of the best way you could finish a performance is, leaving thinking about more ideas, having more thoughts than you had previously. And I think that's what this whole project is about. And certainly for me, in every interaction that I've had with them, and as we continue to lead this project towards being able to combine it with the orchestra, I have no doubts that we'll continue to find even more insights in how the connections between what these artists have done and Hindemith's genius music, how they can come together and perhaps give us a heightened experience that neither of them individually would have been able to do.